So welcome to numerical methods. And today I like to start a new chapter. So we had computer arithmetics, Monte Carlo method, random number generation. We came back a little bit to Monte Carlo and we already discussed how we would do Monte Carlo for time discrete stochastic processes, which is just a vector valued random variable. If you see the time steps as the components of um, a random variable. And today I'd like to start a new chapter and that is the time discretization of stochastic processes. So I consider now a time continuous stochastic process and I would like to have a numerical method, numerical scheme that creates a time discrete approximation such that we can apply all the stuff we did so far. So that connects nicely. Yeah, maybe I should recall a few basic things. Yeah? I assume you all know them and maybe I could also have some nice introductional sessions on that, but uh, maybe let's just recall a few things. Yeah, so what's the stochastic process? So that's nothing special, it's just a family of random variables parameterized by time. So then the setup is usually that you view this over a filtered probability space. And that means all those random variables, X of T, yeah, they are actually share here the same omega. So recall when we discussed random number generation and we discussed sequences of IID random variables. Okay, then I shortly made this comment that how do you model this? Okay, there is in the background the product space and one event in the product space then describes the values of the whole sequence. And that's also the case here. Yeah, So uh, it is that we have say an event omega in omega, and then we get, well, a single function of time. If we evaluate our random variables on that omega. So they all share the same space in the background. So the space omega has to be large if the guys here have some independence coming up uh, as time goes on. So for that reason, we often call omega here also the path. Yeah? So that omega here is sometimes called the path. Maybe that word is not so precise. Sometimes you call it the omega the path, or sometimes you just call this function, you know, t maps to x of t and omega the path, yeah? so the values. Okay, then we have here the word filtered. Yeah? So there is the filtration in the background. So what's that? Okay, so the filtration is just a family of sigma fields parameterized by time that is growing. So f of s is subset of f of t if s is smaller than t. This more or less describes the information that we have in time t. Yeah? So f t is the information that we have in time t. Well, what does it mean information? Well, with respect to the notion of measurability of a random variable. Yeah? So maybe you remember measurability of a random variable means that, okay, on the finest subset that are in this sigma field, the random variable has to be constant. So you can tell something about the value on that subset. 
Yeah. So for example, if the sigma field is just the empty set and the whole set omega, a random variable that is measurable with respect to this sigma field has to be constant. So you can tell the value if you know on which set of the sigma field you are yeah, of the generating uh, sets. So to some extent, this models the information you have or you can have. So the stuff you know that you can tell something about random variables that are measurable with respect to this sigma field. So there's a link between the random variables parameterized by time and the sigma field, yeah, and this is called then to be adapted. So so that just means that xt as a random variable is ft measurable. Well, measurable uh, as a random variable. So xt now maps from omega to, okay, I didn't tell you what's the image space. Say, let's say the image space is r. So it's a real valued random variable. So it maps from omega to r. So to define measurable, you also have to define a sigma field in the image space. So let's say that's the Borel sigma algebra. Yeah? So the one generated by the open sets. So it means that the inverse yeah, is subset of this uh, sigma field. Okay, so I make the assumption that you know these basic uh, concepts. Yeah? So in the following se section, sometimes I just drop the uh, line, okay, let xt be um, a stochastic process defined over the probability space, filter probability space, omega p, f, t, yeah, and the symbols just pop up, yeah, so there will be the p, our probability measure, and the f, t, the sigma field coming from this filtration. So what I like to do now is to discuss the time discretization of stochastic processes, especially E2 stochastic processes. So let's start with a small recapitulation of the two building blocks, the Brown in motion and what is an E2 stochastic process. That's here the definition of a Brown in motion. So we already had the Brown in motion yeah, sometimes in the previous section in our examples, the Black Schultz model, also in the time discrete processes. I looked at stochastic processes driven by the Brownian increments. So that's now here the definition of the Brownian motion. So the Brownian motion is a stochastic process. So it's a family of random variables parameterized by time. So here is the time interval. So by convention, I just start in zero and it has the following properties. So in zero, I'm zero. So let me maybe draw a small picture. That's the time axis. Maybe I just assume that zero is here yeah, so that I can draw it. Okay, then in zero, it's zero. So then the map, yeah, T maps to W of T. So if you look now at a path yeah, for a fixed, Omega, then this is continuous. And now comes a nice thing of the definition because the definition already tells us something about how the time discretization, a time discrete yeah, version of the stochastic process would look like. Because if I have now a time discretization and I just look at the stochastic process at these discrete time steps, or let's say we look at the differences. Okay, that's okay because I already know that this guy here in T0, let's say T0 is zero. Then I know that this guy is zero. Okay, then if I look at these 
increments, then I know something, I know a lot of these increments. They are mutually independent and I even know the distribution. They are normal, normally distributed with mean zero. And okay, so that's here now the vector valued version. Okay, you see here is an R to the N. So you would have to specify a covariance matrix. If it's just a real valued version, then this means that the variance is the time step size. T minus S. Yeah? So standard deviation would be square root of T minus S, the time step size. So this tells me if I would like to know the Brownian motion, say, at this time here, then I know, okay, the increment. So the increment is actually now the same as the Brownian motion because I started in zero. So the Brownian motion at this step here is just a normal distribution with mean zero. So the mean stays here and then some standard deviation square root of the time step. Okay, that looks uh, really a bit, uh, yeah, strange. Why do we have this property? Actually, the number four is more or less um, a consequence of the number three, yeah? because uh, you know that the va variance, if you take two independent normal distributions, yeah, then the variance of the sum is the sum of the variance. Okay, that's easy to show. Yeah, you just plug in the sum in the formula of the variance. Yeah, yeah. so you get uh, x plus y squared. Yeah, and then you get x times x plus y times y plus the mixed term. But the mixed term is zero because they are independent. So you know that the variance of the sum is the sum of the variance. So you know that if you look here at these increments and you build the process by summing up these increments, that the variance has to grow linear in these increments. So actually the number four is to some extent just a consequence from, from the number three. Yeah. Or say the number three and that we have that is normally distributed. Okay, the nice thing about this definition is that we already have a time discretization that the increments or then our time discrete stochastic process is normally distributed. So it fits very, very well to the numerical methods we already know. And this Brown in motion, so this stochastic process is a building block for more stochastic processes. Before I do this, here again, you have this picture yeah, which I just illustrated. So the first one is starting here, say in zero. Okay, then we have a normal distribution with mean zero. Okay, and now if you would like to build a path, yeah, so you draw uh, a realization omega. So that means your first realization is maybe here, this point. Then starting from that point, you build the next realization of the Brown in motion. So the nice thing is that my Brown in motion, say in time, capital TK, if I have a time discretization, this is just the sum I from zero to K minus one W ti plus one minus w ti. Okay, and since you, actually you would have to say plus w of t zero, yeah, the starting point, but since you know that the starting point is zero, I can just drop it. So you see, I can build the power in motion at time, the future time tk by summing up my Brownian increments which are then sometimes called delta W Ti, yeah? so parameterized with the starting point. Okay, so these are here my Brownian increments and I can build the whole thing 
from these steps. If I'm only interested in the stochastic process at discrete times, like in this picture, that's already enough yeah, to build the stochastic process. So you would add another normal distribution to it with mean zero and standard deviation, the time step size, to then generate a drawing from that normal distribution, which gives you then the next point. And the sum is creating now the path. Okay, so now you draw the next point, which is maybe then here and the whole sum is giving you the, and the whole sum is giving you here the path. Okay, so this stochastic process is now the building block for more general stochastic processes where the Ito integral, yeah, so the stochastic um, integral, and these guys are then called Ito stochastic processes. So for an Ito process, you mostly see here this differential notation. So dx is mu of t and x dt plus sigma of t and x dw. So what's behind that is that this is just a short notation. If you just apply here, say to this notation, the integral. So I just apply the integral. So I have here this guy. Uh, and then you get from the short notation, yeah, note that integral s to t d x is just x of t minus x of s. Okay, then you move the x of s to the other side, and you have that x of t is equal x of s, the starting point, plus the integral over the changes. So this guy on top is just the short notation for this integral representation. Okay, where the integrals are, okay, the dt part is the classical Lebesgue integral. Well, classical Lebesgue integral, there is a random variable here inside. So this whole integrand here is a random variable. So just view it pathwise. Yeah? So you plug in an omega, yeah? and then you have a function that you can integrate. So that's just pathwise. And the dw part, so you see I'm integrating here with respect to a Brownian motion. So the dw part where I integrate with respect to the Brownian in motion is then the stochastic integral, which has to be defined separately. But if you look at the definition of the stochastic integral, you see that it's actually the same principle as defining the Lebesgue integral. So in the Lebesgue integral, you have this um, approximating uh, functions. Yeah? So for example, the piecewise constant functions in contrast to yeah, classical Riemann integral, the approximation comes from the image side and not from the domain side. Yeah? But okay, if you look at this, then you see that the stochastic integral is defined in a very similar way, now using instead of elementary functions, elementary stochastic processes. So piecewise constant stochastic processes. Um, and then it's just the integrand yeah, multiplied with the increment. Yeah? So if the integrand is piecewise constant, it's just that constant multiplied with the increment of the integrator that is w of ti plus one minus w of ti. So you see that our normal distributed increments just appear then in this definition. So that second part here is the Ito integral, the stochastic integral. And 
the intuition behind that is very similar to the classical integral, just plugging in um, an omega. This integral representation here is already useful if we would like to construct such a stochastic process, because you could think of the coefficients here or the integrants being piecewise constant, or you could approximate them by piecewise constant approximations. Because if that guy here is a constant, okay, that is just the constant times integral dt, which is just the constant times the time step size. And if that guy here is a constant, then this is just the constant times integral dw, which is just the delta w, the increment. So let's discuss now some numerical schemes. So what I will do in this section here is I will just state time discrete approximations. So we will just go through a few definitions, the Euler scheme, the Milstein scheme, the predictor corrector scheme, and just study a little bit how these time discrete approximations of the time continuous stochastic process behave. And later we will dig a little bit deeper and we will look at convergence. So we will prove convergence of these time discrete schemes. And we will also look at the convergence order and there are different definitions, strong and weak convergence. So we will dig a little bit deeper. We will do that in the next section. But before we discuss the convergence, let me just state a few numerical schemes, a few time discretization schemes. So schemes that give, give us here um, a time discrete stochastic process that in some sense approximates the time continuous stochastic process. And my notation is that I will use the tilde to denote the time discrete stochastic process because it is an approximation. It is not the same process. Okay, so we start with the Euler scheme or euler Mariama scheme. So given an E2 process, so written here in the differential form, dx is mu of t and x dt plus sigma of t and x dw. x of zero is x zero. So I just assume by convention that we start in zero. Okay, that's uh, no issue to just translate it. And given now a time discretization, so I have a time discretization prescribed where I would like to define random variables that approximate x of ti on this time discretization. So then the time discrete stochastic process x tilde of ti is defined as, so maybe you could also add here um, a double dot, yeah, is defined as x tilde of ti plus mu x tilde of ti times delta ti times the time step size plus sigma of x tilde of ti times delta w ti, the Brownian increment. So this thing is called the euler mariama scheme or Euler scheme of the stochastic process x. You see, this is a recursive definition. Yeah, I define the next value as a function of the previous value. So the next random variable is given by the previous random variable plus the change. Uh, so I have to tell you how I start. Of course, I start with the same value as my original stochastic process. So x tilde of zero is x zero. Okay, so there is a slight subtle thing here. Uh, note that we plug in here in the argument of the mu, the x tilde of ti. So of course, I do not know the process x. Yeah? 
I just know the approximations. So when I evaluate here the coefficient, I have to use what I have. And since this is recursive and I'm going forward in the time steps, yeah, the random variable approximation I have for the x is just the x tilde of ti. So often the scheme is just called a uh, Euler scheme, yeah, sometimes stochastic Euler scheme, because you maybe know this scheme also from ordinary differential equations, yeah, where it's also quite common. So the Euler scheme just derives from a simple integration rule. So you go back to the original definition of the Etro stochastic process and you rewrite the differential notation in the integral representation, okay? So then this here is my definition of my stochastic process now viewed on the time discretization. So I have that x of ti plus one is equal to x of ti plus the integral ti to ti plus one mu dt plus the integral ti to ti plus one sigma dw. So that's just applying this stuff here for t equals ti plus one and s equals ti. Okay, and now you make the approximation that this here is Approximately, so so assume mu is continuous, assume also x is continuous in t, then all this stuff is continuous in t. So maybe if the time step is small, this can be approximated by just mu at the beginning. So I just plug in the ti for the little t. If I'm in the interval, from ti to ti plus one. So I then just arrive here at this approximation where this guy is just replaced by that guy. And we do the same here for the sigma, okay? Then this is with respect to the integration a constant. So I can move it to before the integral and I just get that the two integrals are mu evaluated at this point times delta ti or respectively sigma evaluated at this point times delta wti. So for one step, yeah, I now have the approximation that x of ti plus one is approximately x of ti plus mu of ti, x of ti, delta ti plus sigma ti, x of ti. Delta w by prone increment of ti. So now you could say, you just define this as the x tilde of ti. But then for the first step, that would be okay. Okay, you can, for the first step, you can use here x of t zero, x of t zero, x of t zero. But then for the next step, actually, since you do not know the x of t one, you have to replace this guy here by the approximation with the tilde. So we arrive at the scheme where I just have here the approximations plugged in. Okay, that's quite uh, straightforward. Yeah? And actually that's um, a very successful numerical scheme. Yeah? We have uh, convergence order uh, one in the weak sense, convergence order one half in the strong sense. Um, that's already quite nice. So if you make the time step size finer, weak convergence is actually, it sounds weak, but it's the one that is most relevant for us uh, because we will later 
calculate expectations of our functions of this, which can be seen as uh, the weak uh, convergence. Uh, so we have a nice convergence order, yeah, which is uh, linear in uh, actually here, uh, decreasing the time step size. Maybe one small remark. Uh, you see that actually this scheme would have no discretization error if the coefficient here would be a constant from the beginning. So the approximation error or the nature of the approximation comes from the fact that these guys here are uh, not uh, constant in their arguments. Um, where we could even create the exact discretization if they are piecewise constant, say as a function of t only. Yeah. So, but if they start depending on x, yeah, that becomes an issue. Uh, so I would like to have now an improvement if they these coefficients depend, so, they are not constant on their arguments. And let's start by looking at what happens if sigma depends here on, on x. So the first uh, simple example is that I consider the case where sigma is a linear function in x. So I consider the case where the sigma of t and x is actually some constant sigma star times x. So I have here the sigma star times x. Uh, I'm currently not interested in the discretization error of the mu. That will be my next topic when I talk about the predictor corrector scheme. So let's consider the case where the sigma depends on the x. So in this case, actually, you can derive the exact solution of this stochastic process. So if you have here the initial value in zero is x zero. So how could you derive the exact solution of this stochastic process? Now maybe you know this trick. You can apply Etos lemma to transform this stochastic process to a stochastic process that has constant coefficients. And the trick is that you just define y as the logarithm of x, okay? And then Ito's lemma tells you dy is, okay, minus one half sigma star squared dt. Okay, that, that's coming from Ito's lemma because you have here the derivative of the logarithm, the second derivative gives you this uh, minus one half squared. Okay, we have that dy is a stochastic process with constant coefficient. So the nice thing is that we have now a constant coefficient stochastic process. Why? Then I can just integrate. So which gives me that y of t is y of s minus one half sigma star squared t minus s plus sigma star w of t minus w of s. Okay. And now you transform back. Yeah? So transforming back is taking the exponential and you get that x of t, the exponential of y is x of s, the exponential of y multiplied with, okay, the exponential of this stuff here. So I have an exact discretization scheme, yeah? So the next value is the previous value multiplied with something, well, something that I can 
calculate, yeah. So where I have here just the pounding pound increment. So for that stochastic process, actually, I would know a time discretization scheme that has no time discretization error because this is the exact solution. So if you now write this here with S being little t and capital T being t plus delta t, a time step, uh, I have that x at the next time step, t plus delta t, is x at the previous time step times exponential minus one half sigma squared delta t plus sigma delta w. Yeah? So sigma now, the constant sigma star. Um, yeah, that doesn't look like the Euler scheme. Okay, so I have um, x of t multiplied with the exponential. If I would like to make it a bit similar to the Euler scheme, okay, what I can do is uh, I just add here the x of t, okay, so that I would like to have here in the front. And then I also need to subtract the x of t, but then subtracting this x of t, I can just write it here with a minus one inside this packet. Uh, so of course I can make this look a little bit more like the Euler scheme. So I have the next value. The next value is given by the previous value plus the change. And this change is now x of t multiplied with exponential minus one half sigma star squared delta t plus sigma star delta w in the exponential minus one. Okay, so that would be the exact discretization scheme. What would the Euler scheme do? Let's go back. Our example is sigma star x of t d dw. So in the Euler scheme, I have the x of t here. In the Euler scheme, it would be that this part here would be approximated by sigma star delta w of t. What's actually that? Consider a Taylor expansion for this part here. So you have that exponential of x is one plus x plus x squared half plus and so on, higher order terms. So you see actually that this one here is canceled by this one. So if you have a Taylor expansion, the first elements of this guy here are the x, so the argument itself, plus the x squared half. So this argument here squared half. So you see the x is this minus one half delta t, the sigma star delta w. And now you see that the term in the Euler scheme is just x sigma star delta w. It's actually not even the first term of the Taylor expansion. It's half of it because this guy is missing. Okay, so why is it half of it? Uh, remember that the expectation of the Brownian increment is zero. Huh? Expectation of the Brownian increment is zero. But expectation of the Brownian increment squared is delta t. Yeah? So delta w has mean zero and variance time step size. So that is delta t. So you see that from this, that the way the values of the Brownian motion change over one time step is a little bit like a delta t to the power of one half, like a square root of delta t. So that's the way like the values change as time changes, if you look at the Brownian motion. 
of course, in expectation, it's zero, huh? but the values, they do, do have changes. So this guy is a little bit like a delta t to the power of one half. And this guy here is a delta t to the power of one. So actually you see that in the theta expansion, you not only have the terms x, x squared, and so on. If you look at the terms with respect to how do they behave in time, it's actually that you have half, yeah? so delta t to the power of one half, one, delta t to the power of one, and then maybe the next guy is delta t to the power of three over two, yeah? Um, so the third one, yeah? That actually the product of delta t and delta w. So what we could think of, we do a Taylor expansion of this thing, and then we try to include a little bit more terms with respect to the delta t. That's now the main idea here when we derive the Milstein scheme. Okay, so compare yeah, that's just the summary what I just did. Uh, so compare this expression here to the Euler scheme. So in the Euler scheme, I have here the x tilde times sigma delta w. And in my time discretization scheme here, I have here the x times the sigma delta w, you know, but I have a little bit more stuff. And if you now do the Taylor expansion of this expression, then you arrive at, okay, so we do the Taylor expansion. Let me write this here again. Exponential x minus one. So this is the stuff in the bracket here. This is x plus x squared half, and then we just stop. So I get here that this is approximately x multiplied with the argument minus one half sigma star squared delta t plus sigma star delta w plus one half all the stuff squared. Yeah. So My argument here, once here, and once squared. So let's multiply here this guy out. Yeah. So if I factor this out here, the squared, I actually get three terms. So I get one half sigma star delta w squared. Then I get the mixed term, the delta t delta w term. So two times yeah, minus one half. So it's a minus sigma squared, uh, sigma star squared times sigma star, so to the power of three, sigma star to the power of three, delta t delta w. And then I get this guy squared here. So I get the delta t squared term. Okay, so and now you see if you recall here, yeah, this little intuition. So if you recall here this little intuition that the delta w is a little bit like a square root of delta t. So you see you have a square root of delta t guy here that changes as the square root of delta t. You have a delta t guy here, okay? Then I have here a delta w squared, okay? That's the variance that changes when time changes like delta t. So that's a delta t term. And then you have here a delta t times delta w, that's a delta t to the power of three half. So if you now, think that you do the next approximation. So the next approximation is that we just consider the terms up to the delta t. So we just forget about these guys here. So we consider these as higher order terms.
So consider them as higher order terms. So just drop them and we have the next approximation. Then we suddenly have these three guys here. So I have X times Sigma Delta W. So I have X times Sigma Delta W plus additional guys. So plus the X times one half Sigma squared, whoops. one half sigma star squared delta t, one half sigma star squared delta w squared. Yeah. So the first one with a minus. So I just have here plus one half and the x from the front. Sigma star squared delta w squared minus delta t. And you see that in expectation, this additional term here would be zero. But it is not zero, well, on specific paths, yeah, point-wise. So we are adding a correction that in expectation is zero. So that looks maybe nice, yeah. So recall this first part here is exactly the thing that we have in the Euler scheme. And this is now some additional part. And it is the additional part by considering from the Taylor expansion of the correct solution, all the terms up to the delta t. Okay, so that's now my Milstein scheme. So the Milstein scheme has here this additional, additional correction term. And the additional correction term involves here the sigma star squared. Yeah, recall, what was the general case? The general case was that I have a function sigma of t and x of t. And in our situation, we just considered that there was here a sigma star times x. Yeah? So actually this sigma star squared will in the general case correspond to sigma prime of t and x of t, that's just sigma star, multiplied with sigma of t and x of t. Okay, that will be not this part, that will be actually this whole part here, yeah? So this part, the x of t times sigma star squared actually corresponds in the general case to the sigma times the sigma prime, where sigma prime is the d by dx. So differentiate with respect to the dependency on the x. Okay, that was natural because we just assumed that we have a linear dependency in the x component. Yeah. So in our small motivation. So in the general Milstein scheme, we now have this expression here in this place here, okay. So this stuff, one half times this stuff is multiplied here with this thing, yeah, which in expect, uh, expectation is zero. So that's uh, the Milstein scheme. So given now again, um, E2 process, dx is mu dt plus sigma dw, and we have a time discretization given. I now define the Milstein scheme as, yeah, it is the next approximation is the previous approximation plus an Euler step. Okay, this thing here is an Euler step. plus one half sigma times sigma prime, delta W squared minus delta T. Yeah? So this thing is the Milstein correction. 
okay, this is the Mestrand scheme. And maybe we can explore yeah, how this scheme improves the discretization. So this Milstein scheme only gives me an improvement if the sigma parameter depends on x. So it only operates on the dw part, the sigma dw part. So the following scheme is now looking at the dt part. And recall that the dt part in the Euler scheme is approximated by taking the starting value, so the value at the starting time point, and multiply it with the time step. So if you think of classical integration rules, that's actually just the scheme where you have a function here. And if that here is now your interval, then you look up the starting value and draw a small rectangle. So that's your uh, approximation. But you know that you can easily, for example, improve this integration rule by taking the trapezoidal rule there you take the starting point and the end point. So why not improve this integration by taking the starting point and the end point of the interval. And in addition to what you did before, you add also this little triangle here. Though that's then the approximation that ti, ti plus one, mu of t, I write the stochastic process that now also here in the mu, but actually I'm considering, say, either on a fixed path omega, or I'm considering just the classical integration rule yeah, with a classical function. So actually, what's that? Okay, that's the middle uh, of taking delta ti, uh, taking mu times delta ti with the first point and mu times delta ti with the last point. That's just the average of this. Yeah? Okay, that's just mu ti x of ti plus mu ti plus one x of ti plus one. half times delta ti. Okay, that's, uh, and this integration scheme uh, is a big improvement, yeah, because uh, you see that here this triangle can have quite a large size, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe we should do this and do a time discretization scheme with taking the starting point and the end point in the integral. But there's a small issue, and that's the reason why I wrote here the uh, stochastic process. If I use this as a time discretization scheme for the stochastic process, I have to know the stochastic process at the end point. Yeah? So the issue is here that I do not know this value. So I would, I would like to use the scheme to create an approximation for this value. So I need to know this value before. Well, but then just use an Euler scheme to create the approximation of that value and then plug this approximation of the endpoint in this numerical scheme and create a better endpoint. And that's the reason why the next scheme is called predictor-corrector scheme. Yeah? We first take an Euler scheme to predict the step. So again, yeah, this is an Euler scheme with predictor-corrector step. So I have an e to stochastic process in our form, dx is mu dt plus sigma dw. I have a time discretization given. And what I now do is 
I first do an Euler scheme step. So that means X tilde at Ti plus one, the next time step is X tilde at Ti plus mu of Ti, X tilde Ti delta Ti plus sigma of Ti, X tilde Ti uh, delta W Ti. That's an Euler step. Okay, I call this here star because I will just use it to define the original scheme. That's here is an Euler step. And this Euler step is the predictor. It's predicting the value. And then I use that to do the trapezoidal integration rule in the numerical scheme. So I replace the classical Euler step that is the mu at the starting time point times delta ti with the trapezoidal time step. Yeah? One half mu at the starting time plus one plus uh, one half mu at the end time point times delta ti. Okay, but I do not know the end time point, but I can plug in here the predicted value in the drift approximation of my numerical scheme. So, and this then defines the true, or this then defines my approximation of X tilde at the next time step. Of course, the uh, delta W part is still the same. Yeah? You could also do now a combination Mills time scheme yeah, for the delta W and predictor corrector for the drift part. Yeah? Of course, then we already have a fourth uh, uh, approximation scheme. But this numerical scheme is called the predictor corrector scheme. Um, you see that actually here, this is the part that also occurs in the Euler step. So you see that the predictor corrector scheme actually does the following. Once you know the X tilde star, you remove one half from the Euler scheme drift and you add one half of the drift that includes the predictor. So actually you can also write this that you use the Euler predicted value and you subtract one half mu at ti and you add one half mu at ti plus one, which is a bit nicer because then you do not need to calculate this here uh, twice. Yeah, from a numerical or computational point of view, that's a bit nicer. You can also write this now as using the previous Euler step and you just apply um, a correction term. And the correction term is one half the drift with the predicted value minus one half the drift with the um, Euler value. Okay, so you just have a correction term. Now, like in the Milstein scheme, where I have an Euler scheme plus a correction term. Now I have an Euler step, Euler scheme plus a correction term and it's correction term for the drift. Yeah, interpretation, I already explained it. You can view it as the trapezoidal integration rule, uh, but with a predictor step because you do not know the endpoint of the function. Okay, this last uh, formula yeah, as a tip is a bit more efficient in the computer and also the code is much cleaner because you just have the Euler scheme and then you can decide will you do a predictor step, predictor corrector uh, correction or not. Yeah? The same for the Milstein scheme. So my next session would be to exercise this a little bit on a log normal process. Yeah? But uh, yeah, we leave time is up. So maybe we do this in the next session. That was it.